Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and welcome to Everything Cooperative this wonderful, wonderful day. You know, we have Mr. David Thompson on the line with us this, this morning from California. Good morning, David. Good morning, Vernon. How are you today? I am great. I am really, really great. And I consistently and continuously look for your book talking about the co-ops and the civil rights movement. When am I going to be able to read that thing? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> it's going to be a little while. Um, you know, in my professional business, we build nonprofit housing, and we are we are the busiest we've ever ever been. And so that takes, you know, putting a roof over somebody's head takes uh, takes precedence over another page of my book. So it's going to be a couple of years. All right. So you are building co-op housing? No, nonprofit housing. Nonprofit housing. Right. So what kind of projects do you have online? Well, we have um, we have a, a 500 units in in process at the moment, and um, a majority of those are uh, nonprofit housing for seniors and nonprofit housing for uh, people with disabilities. That's the uh, things that Neighborhood Partners uh, does uh, the best. Neat, neat. 500 units. That's a lot. And this is mm-hmm. in, in California? Yeah, yeah, just in California. All right, buddy. Right. Yeah, cooperatives are what I'd love to do, but it's not so easy to build housing cooperatives. Is that because of financing? Somewhat, but it's it's mainly because in California the land is so costly that to be able to, you know, if you do a project at market rate, it has to be a pretty high cost, and we're always looking for cooperative housing to be affordable to people at moderate income levels, and you can't make it pencil out, and there's no there's no government money for, uh, you know, to subsidize cooperatives. So uh, there's no there's no road like the tax credit program. I find that always interesting. It's a little bit away from civil rights and cooperatives, but I find it interesting that if you look at housing co-ops, and there was a study done, NCB financed it, but it looked at HUD-funded housing co-ops compared to HUD-funded apartment buildings, and in every variable, whether that's the amount of rent over time, how well the property was kept, how good people felt in their community and they had a say in it and all of those, every variable you could think of. Also, return on investment was higher in the co-op. The co-ops Correct. outperformed. They paid their taxes. They they had less crime. Every variable. And you're going to go, why won't politicians put money into something that works better and that's always I agree. frustrating. I agree. Me. Always frustrated me. So they come out with tax credits, and who wins on a tax credit deal? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And right. that's, that's sort of I've come to conclude that the people that win on a tax credit deal are the people that already have money. That's the ones that can afford tax credits. And then those are the ones that also build apartment buildings for the most part, unless it's a company like yours that does it for nonprofit. And then they, they make the money off of the uh, apartment buildings. So it's the people right. that already have money or making money. It's more in this divided, this huge gap in wealth. And our government is, is supporting that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's okay. the way it is at the moment. All right. So we've got to change that. So let's go back to civil rights and the co-op movement. And I'm always curious, and you've told me sometime before since you've been on the program, of how you get into this, being a chap from England, how'd you get into the civil rights movement and co-ops as a, as a passion? 
Well, the, the origin of it, I think I would say, is that um, my parents ran a pub in the east of England and uh, a public house, you know, with a little hotel above. You know, it was an inn, as you might say. Mm -hmm. we, we had room for about 22 uh, overnight guests. And um, we were very close to a USAF uh, air base. And at the weekend, uh, the people on the base who were off came into town for, you know, to fun, music, go to the cinema, go to uh, a ballroom, go for a drink or something like that. But regretfully, and this is in 1953, the pubs in town put up a color bar so that they all agreed, all the pubs in town agreed that they would not serve black airmen. They would serve white, but not black. And uh, my mother and father took it upon themselves to say that we are not going to do that. We are not going to be discriminatory, and we will serve black airmen. So as a result, our pub became very popular with the black airmen that were uh, on the base and came into town. And many of them became really good friends. And uh, one of them, whose name was, was, was Wesley, um, was the uh, boxing champion. And I loved boxing. And so he would bring me boxing gloves and various other things from the base. And my uh, parents let them stay uh, in the lodging upstairs. And of course, that was the only place they could stay in Boston. So we still had rationing in England until uh, 1956 or so. So one of the things that Wes did is he bought things at the PX for our family so that we could, you know, get sugar, flour, meat, various other things like that that just weren't available on the regular market. And I became, you know, adopted by the black airmen that came. As a young kid, I'd be about 11 years old. But I was well aware of the discrimination and why they were staying at the pub. And all of the other pubs in town put a blockade on doing business with my parents because they were breaking that blockade. So we, you know, we felt a certain level of that discrimination. Certainly not the same as uh, as what Wes and his fellow people were doing. So that brought me into touch with the civil rights movement, to, with the rights of uh, blacks. And when I came to the United States, um, I became uh, involved with the civil rights movement as soon as I arrived. And it was uh, in Ooh. Florida. And what year was that? New York. What year was that when that you That would be 1962. Okay. Right. So I became involved in... Uh, in, in uh, activities in, in Florida and then in New York City. And in New York City, I was the um, chief shop steward for the uh, union for the restaurant workers, and our restaurant would not employ blacks. And um, I worked with uh, the rest of the people in the union to force the restaurant owner to um, <laughs> accept that blacks could be employed if they were good enough and had the same quality and characteristics, they they could get jobs. And so we broke the color bar for uh, Restaurant Associates, which owned about 10 major restaurants in New York at the time. Wow. So as a kid, you got candy bar, chocolate from the blacks. Yeah, double bubble. My first <laughs> double bubble was from from, <laughs> from Wes. In 1960, was, uh, 1962, I think I was going into high school. And I think, no, maybe the ninth grade, I was still in middle school. So you were over here and in the civil rights movement already. Good news. Yeah. Good news. Now, your parents must have been very brave. They were. Some people might also say they were foolish. But um, I tend to think of them as brave and ethical and uh, just very committed to doing what was the correct thing. My mother was uh, was very Christian, and she looked at it from the point of view of being a good Christian. 
Okay, I'm a Christian too, but I don't want to go down that road because people that read the Bible, they just seem to come up with different interpretations than, than I do. So sometimes people that read the Bible and they say they are Christians, they'll do just the opposite and they, they, they sort of say slavery was God's way and all of that. So, yeah, so, yeah. So she read the Bible and maybe came across, came away with the same kind of interpretation I do that we were all made in God's image. All yeah, right. yeah, yeah. She was very determined. She she was um, indefatigable. Indefigata- <laughs> okay, that's a new term for me too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, she wasn't going to give up. She she was committed to doing that, and that's what she did. So in New York. In 19, were you in 1962 in New York? Correct. Uh huh. So you were there when they were forming the March on Washington. Yes, I was. Mm -hmm. And were you involved in that at all? No, no, I was, I was, um, at that time, I I was just involved in the union efforts to uh, break the color bar at Restaurant Associates. So let's, let's talk a little bit about. Penn South in New York. So Penn South is a co-op. And I, I have you have told me before that that's sort of like was the home of the development of the March on Washington. That's where things took place. That's where organizing happened. Tell us a little bit about right. that story. Bayard Rustin, who was the main organizer of the March on Washington, lived at Penn South Co-op. And um, amongst the people living in the same cooperative were um, a group that came to uh, be the core organizing committee of the March on Washington. And um, they lived at that co-op and they were, um, you know, the, the, uh, the key activists in developing the March on Washington. The first meeting was called at Bayard Rustin's co-op apartment. Uh, and Bay Ra- Baynard seems to be um, a brilliant, brilliant person, as I've as you've told me about him and uh, as I've read about him. But he Correct. seemed like yeah. he would have been crazy, too. I'm surprised. Because he was a communist, he was gay, and he, he was, was a Quaker. He was a Quaker? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> And he was in the civil rights movement in a big way. I'm, you know, I'm surprised that people didn't try to kill him back then. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they did. He has been a symbol of many different um, civil rights struggles, uh, but, but in particular, the March on Washington, and uh, he was, um, he was. The, the main organizer behind many of the major black activities during the 50s and 60s. Well, David, and David, was, David uh, we've got to take our first break. We're going to come back and talk okay. some more about Bernard Rustin sure. and the civil rights movement and the, the way co-ops have worked in and been a part of the civil rights movement. But we'll be right okay. back. Please don't touch that dial. Information is power. Information is power. And this is why WOL makes a great partner for this show, because here we are giving you information so that if you use that information and knowing which co-ops that you can go work with, which how to start a co-op, how you can get power, how you can in your in your community, using that power is where it comes from. So we're talking about Baynard Rustin before we left Mr. David Thompson. And yep. It seems like that Penn South, uh, as a co-op, a place to live, is a community in which would protect him. It's sort of like I have it sort of like as an incubator. It could, it could be a place where the, it's a community. If people know each other and work together and strive together to to help support each other in the values of co-ops, of honesty, uh, what's that? Openness, social responsibility, and caring for others. That right. that might be how he was able to survive, and why that became sort of like the hub of this organizing for the March on Washington. That- yeah, the um, the co-op had been uh, sponsored by the Amalgamated Workers Union, 
and they uh, gave a preference early on to uh, union members and Bayard being um, an activist also within the union community was asked if he would like to be there and uh, he said yes. A. Philip Randolph who was the head of the uh, International Pullman Workers Union, the first black union leader and the chair of the March on Washington. Uh, he also lived at the co-op uh, in his later years. And uh, Norman Hill, who organized uh, the staff for the March on Washington, lived there. Uh, Rochelle Horowitz, who was um, also with the unions and lived there, she uh, ran the transportation for the March on Washington, and a number of people lived in her apartment during the uh, the work on the March on Washington. So yeah, yeah, Co Penn South was was a great place to be, and at the uh, at the heart of all of that activity. So is Penn South about five hundred units? Uh, no, it's um, do 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 do. Good question. You would mm. ask it. No, it's um, I think it's close to three thousand. Wow. I okay. could be wrong, but um, it's it's a pretty large co-op, and it's on the uh, it's on the same street as the Empire State Building, I think. Okay. That Twenty Third Street. It, it goes for um, about six city blocks. Okay, so that's a great place to live to organize and and the civil rights movement back there. Um, you had the FBI against the folks, and you had a lot of a lot of things that he had had to dodge and take care of. So, so I just, I just see him as a great guy. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Amazing. And, um, it, it's interesting. The FBI of course have had to publish all of their uh, records, uh, of Bayard Rustin. And so a lot that I have found out about different phone calls he made, you know, meetings he went to, um, that entail cooperatives, I've found out through the FBI records. So I, I am thankful to the FBI for some things. Okay. Okay. So we're in New York getting ready for the March on Washington. And what are some of the other people that had a role in, like I, I'd say you talk about Harry Belafonte was a key fundraiser for the march. Yes. Um, Mr. Belafonte himself had uh, recently organized a housing cooperative he was not able uh, in the early, in the late 50s there was still a color bar going on in new york uh, for property and so blacks were not encouraged or generally not allowed to buy property um, there was um, uh, some street in new york city above which uh, blacks could and below which they couldn't and um, Harry Belafonte wanted to live closer downtown to where his work was and his um, entertainment was, and um, found that he went to look at this apartment to try to buy it. And when he said he would buy it, the owner said, well, you can't. I'm not going to sell it to you, and turned him down. Um, Belafonte sent his business manager uh, back a week later to buy the apartment, and the business manager was allowed to buy the apartment, but he was buying it with Mr. Belafonte's money, and so uh, the uh, the the unit became his. But Belafonte then turned around and uh, worked with other people, and they bought all of the apartments in the building and turned it into a housing cooperative. And Lena Horn was one of the original members of that particular cooperative. But it was in that co-op apartment that Martin Luther King stayed when he was uh, going to New York for whatever it was that he did. And that's where he wrote uh, his famous speech for the Riverside Church against the Vietnam War. And in that co-op housing unit, it was regarded as the, the, the center for the Southern um, so the Southern um, activists and for the, for civil rights, that apartment of Harry Belafonte was regarded as the New York office of all of those groups. So you have co-ops as a huge sort of role in the civil rights movement of, of the March on Washington and 
Martin Luther King staying there. Who were some of yeah. the other people involved? Well, uh, another one would be uh, James Farmer. Um, James Farmer uh, was the head of uh, CORE, the Congress on Racial Equality. He lived in a housing cooperative on the southwest side of uh, New York City. He organized numerous activities. Many, many of the key core meetings were held there. You know, there was a huge protest against the World's Fair at the time because they were not employing enough blacks to work on the site because there was a lot of um, a lot of employment through the uh, the World's Fair in New York at the time. And, and uh, CORE took a pretty big role in that. And then CORE also led lots of efforts to break down housing segregation. And so that apartment, that co-op apartment that he lived in was uh, a critical part of the organizing of that time. He was um, supposed to uh, speak at the March on Washington, but he had been arrested a couple of days earlier and couldn't get bail, and therefore his place uh, at the March on Washington was taken by his deputy, Floyd McKissick. <clears throat> Nothing like going to jail for what you believe in. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Mm. Eleanor Holmes, Nor who she right. lives right here in D.C. She what, is a wonderful, was... wonderful representative. She worked on the march. She was actually the the person given the job of closing down the office on the Saturday of the march and flying into D.C. And um, she was up there in New York working on it. She was living at Rachel R Rachel Horowitz's apartment at, at Penn South and uh, going to work every day to organize the march. And uh, throughout her life, Eleanor... Norton Holmes has been a very strong supporter of uh, cooperatives, craft cooperatives, consumer cooperatives, housing cooperatives, and that has been um, a part of what she has supported while she has been in Congress. And so she became the first elected representative of the uh, District of Columbia. She's been there a quite a long time. I think we'd try to reach out and get her on the show. I didn't know she had that big a... Big a yeah. um, interest in co-ops. Yeah. I know, know John Lewis does. So can you speak to him a little yeah. bit? So well, John is um, somebody that I have tremendous regard for, and I also have a friendship with. Well, um, John, of course, was uh, well. There's a funny little story there with uh, with John Lewis. Um, he was practicing his speech for the March on Washington. He was in New York City um, going over the last details of the march with all of the other leaders and practicing his speech. And uh, the people in his hotel told him that uh, he couldn't keep speaking like that. It was too loud and it was disturbing the other guests and he had to get out. Uh, so he called Rochelle Horowitz and said, I've, I've been turned out of my hotel because I'm talking too much, so may I come there and practice my speech? So uh, John Lewis um, then turned up at her apartment, knocked on the door, came in, and, and then did started doing his speech. So Rochelle said she heard his speech before it ever was heard by everybody, and it was a pretty amazing speech because of what he said and how he said it. Uh, but that speech was practiced at uh, at the Penn South Co-op. Later on we, we, in his professional life... Uh, David, we've got to take our second yeah. break here already, and we'll no come problem. back and talk more about John Lewis. We'll be right back. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WOS, at 95.9 FM. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. The program is Everything Cooperative, and we have Mr. David Thompson on the line with us. We're talking about blacks and the role of the civil rights movement. And before we took break, we were talking about John Lewis, 
who gave a speech, and he's the last living speaker at that 1963 march. Continue talking about, about John Lewis, would you? Well, um, I think that John was about 22 when he gave his speech. He he was extremely young relative to the other participants, but, you know, he represented the uh, Southern Nonviolent um, Coordinating Committee and, um, you know, did a lot of work for cooperatives while he was with SNCC, and then he worked for two or three other organizations in the South that were working on economic development, and in in that role, he uh, helped to support the the creation of a number of uh, different cooperatives, uh, crafts, consumer, credit unions, housing, uh, that kind of thing. And where I met John was um, we offered him a job with the National Cooperative Bank when it was uh, created to be our liaison to black communities throughout the United States. And I had the proud honor of uh, going with John uh, when he did a tour of California meeting with uh, Tom Bradley as the mayor of L.A. and Willie Brown as the mayor of San Francisco and other black elected uh, officials to uh, encourage them to support black cooperatives. And John was um, extremely good and knowledgeable about all of that. And uh, it is something that in another life he would have been uh, really, really good at. But I'm glad, as uh, as I think most Americans would be, that he has been just such a figurehead for the the civil rights movement in the United States. Well, that's... um... So that makes him about 78 if he was 22 in 1963, 56 years ago. So yeah, two, two years ago, he spoke at the Federation of Southern Co-ops 50th anniversary, which was started in 1967, was right during the Civil Rights Movement where this cooperative of co-ops was formed, and they've been on the show several times. Right, right. Yeah, John has always been, you know, through his being – a Congress member on the Hill, he has always been extremely supportive of uh, getting funding, especially from the USDA, for the Federation of Southern Cooperatives to help deal with black poverty in the rural South. So with that, it's a great segue into talking about Charles and Shirley Sherrard. Uh-huh. Because they sued the USDA. Can you talk a little they bit did. about them? Well, they, they, they too are two of my heroic people. Charlie Sherrod, if you read any book about civil rights in the 1960s and you go to the index, you will see uh, Charlie Sherrod uh, mentioned in that index because he played such a role. But he was determined to uh, work in Albany, uh, Georgia in particular, on movements that would benefit the uh, local economy, especially for blacks. And one thing that he and his wife Shirley uh, developed was, um, I think it was called New Communities USA, but it was the first land trust in America. What um, Charlie and others had figured out was if we if we could um, own land and then lease it to black farmers, that was the way in which we could get black farmers back onto the land. And so I believe that they accumulated over a thousand acres of land uh, near New Albany, uh, Georgia, and, um, and, and created that type of community. But when they took those farmers to the USDA to borrow money for crops and various other things, uh, the USDA DA would find ways not to lend them money. And as a result, um, the New Communities uh, Land Trust uh, went into bankruptcy because of its inability to get loans for the work that it was doing. Wow. And um, they, uh, they took USDA to court. It was in court for many, many years, but eventually – the uh, USDA agreed that they had been discriminating against new communities and they were the cause of that and uh, therefore they uh, 
owed all of the people that had created it um, money, and uh, the Sherrods have now um, put all of that money together. They bought new land, and they've started all over again, even though they are in their 70s. Well, I had a chance to meet them, and they're my heroes also. It's, uh, it's awesome what they yeah. were able to do back then and still are doing. So you, you got all of this going on, and you have mentioned there was what was it called the Big Six in the in the march, and you mentioned uh, A. Philip Randolph and Bernard Rustin, James Farmer, and John Lewis. Um, the other two, could you talk about them? Roy Whit- uh, Wilkins, uh, director of NAACP, and Whitney Young, executive director of right. Urban League. Um, well, Roy Wilkins was the um, head of uh, NAACP for many, many years. He was um, a quiet leader, but um, very, very, very committed and, uh, you know, was the head of the NAACP during the most difficult years of which you could be head of that organization because of all that went on after the Second World War in particular. Wilkins supported a lot of development of cooperatives. The NAACP in its earlier period was a big supporter of cooperatives, and uh, part of that came through the efforts of uh, Ella Jo Baker, who was the uh, the New York office manager of the NAACP and uh, somebody who had grown up organizing cooperatives and developing cooperatives and had a tremendous impact upon Harlem during the 1930s and 40s and was, uh, in many people's minds, one, one of the great minds of the civil rights movement and particularly of the the um, commitment to democratic control over the agendas of the organizations. But um, Roy Wilkins was uh, fortunate enough to get housing. Uh, The United Nations had built housing for its employees because they knew that they had so many employees that would be coming from, you know, developing countries and would be people of color and that they would not be able to find any place that easy to live in New York City. So the United Nations actually built a very, very large um, apartment complex and made it available to the employees so that they didn't have to suffer the uh, discrimination that was occurring. Roy Wilkins was lucky enough to be able to get one of the apartments um, at that particular um, apartment building. Uh, That apartment building, um, Roy Wilkins and his wife voted for it, but that apartment building voted to go co-op, and um, Roy Wilkins regretfully died of a heart attack uh, the year that that building became a housing cooperative and therefore a safe home for many, many hundreds of, uh, of people of color in New York City. Wow. And Whitney Young. Whitney Young um, came from a different element of the um, of the civil rights movement. He was the executive director of the Urban League. Um, I think he came out of Detroit or Chicago, so he hadn't had to deal with the same sort of color bar issues in the same way as they were dealing with them in New York. And I believe when he came to New York, he had enough money to buy a home in up uh, in up upstate. Well, not upstate, but I think it's, it's up in New York City, which is where the blacks were allowed to uh, own homes. So he, he was the only one that wasn't living, of all of them, who wasn't living in um, a co-op or a protected apartment. And the Urban League did uh, quite a lot for cooperatives in its early times for uh, economic development to uh, benefit um, black creation. But um, the Urban League's model was much more tied into uh, 
getting getting jobs for blacks in firms that were uh, kind of in the Fortune 500 uh, companies, and uh, they were very successful at being able to create a, a larger workforce uh, opportunity for black workers, but um, they they didn't take uh, an interest in developing black cooperatives for blacks themselves. Hmm. So what was the role of the Big Six in the march? Well, they were... Um, they were the original um, decision-making group for the March on Washington. The uh, the first two were Philip Randolph and Bayard Rustin. They brought in, the, then I think, James Farmer. And then they invited Martin Luther King to join, and he was reticent about it, but eventually decided that he would. And uh, Roy Wilkins was the last person to come on board. Wilkins did not want to be associated with Bayard Rustin because of his ex-communist affiliations. And um, what the Big Six then decided was that um, Philip Randolph would be named as the chair of the march and Bayard Rustin would be the director and that way, um, Roy Wilkins agreed that if that was going to be the, 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 the status, then he would support it, but he would not support a march where Bayard Rustin was the leader. Okay. All right. So that's, that is a tremendous, tremendous history. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. My um, pleasure. So why co-ops? What's the... What makes co-ops so unique or beneficial, particularly for marginalized people, whether they're black or brown or Asian of anybody, even whites, there's more white people than black people, but more white poor people in the U.S. than black poor people. Um, so why, why co-ops? What, what's the benefits of co-ops? Well, co-ops, for the main part, do their best when they are um, well-serving their members. And uh, in many cases, people of color and people of lower classes, um, you know, they are neglected by the marketplace. And so, therefore, uh, they end up paying more for things than most people do. And so the idea of joining together to create a, a grocery co-op so that you can buy food a little cheaper and you can get better quality food is one of the ways in which cooperatives can service people, but you can also create jobs for the local neighborhood and therefore help to, uh, you know, um, fight poverty in that particular area. Uh, so food cooperatives have have uh, played quite often a role, and they're probably the most um, present type of uh, cooperative in the world when you when you sort of count it by the numbers of David, consumers who are members. David, I'm sorry to cut you yep. off, but we're going into sure. our last break. Yep. Uh, we'll be right back and talk more about the benefits of co-ops. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and David Thompson is our guest on Everything Co-op, which is sponsored you know, we've been sponsored now for five and a half years by NCB, and NCB's mission is to support and be an advocate for America's cooperatives and their members, especially in low-income communities, by providing innovative financial and related services. So we're talking about the benefits of co-ops, and before we took the break, you said that you can normally get better quality products and you can create jobs, and this is particularly true in low-income communities, and that's why NCB uh, was formed to help these communities that we're talking about. So what are some of the other benefits, David? Well, um, in many ways, I feel that a lot of people get their first sense of democratic organizations through uh, the cooperatives that may be in their neighborhood, um, it's uh, always very difficult for uh, poor people, in particular of any particular color or creed, uh, 
to uh, see, you know, how the world is controlled. And so seeing a, a cooperative in your neighborhood, knowing that its members are people like your uh, your parents and your grandparents, and that it is uh, run by the community and run for the community. So you get your first taste of democracy um, in cooperatives in, in most of the areas of the world where uh, where poverty is you know so that's one of the one of the best things for it but it also it helps promote leadership people showing people how to become leaders and how to stay leaders and throughout the world many people who were uh, once active in the cooperative movement uh, then you know move into politics and nonprofit worlds and play a big role uh, in in those as they uh, proceed through their lives. So quite a lot of uh, political politicians and political offices are held by people who started off in cooperatives. Yeah, I've heard that sometimes they go into school boards, uh, city council, yeah. mm -hmm. they learn how to organize in this social wealth. They, they can create social wealth and financial wealth in the co-op. Correct, correct. Okay. So I have it that you get better quality products and a lot of times at a lower price, at least as good a price as the marketplace and sometimes lower price, can create jobs and you have this democratic organization so you can learn how to work in a democratic organization with an organization that's run by and for the people and this promotes leadership. Uh, it does. Get social, yes. social and political, social and financial wealth. I guess political wealth comes out of that too. Okay, learn how to organize. Yeah. So in in this world of co-ops and the civil rights movement, uh, we didn't talk about the Highlander School, um, but you get education and training and everything going on. Why why do they fail? Um, what what happens to co-ops? What what goes on? What's your idea behind that? Well, um, like like other businesses, you know, cooperatives do fail. Um, you were using statistics earlier, but the failure rate of cooperatives is the lowest of any corporate form of business in the United States. So cooperatives last longer than uh, any other kind of business, but on occasion they do fail. And they they may fail for reasons such as you know the change in the marketplace um you know the thing that i'm regretting most at this particular point is that um the uber and lyft programs um are are seen by people as having lots of virtues but there are some downsides and one of the biggest downsides is their impact upon the uh, taxi cooperatives all around the United States. Uh, most people wouldn't know it, but when you get into a cab in many in many cities, that cab is 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 owned by a driver uh, who is a member of a cooperative and the cooperative uh, is the one that runs the organization. But by banding together as co as as a cooperative, those taxi drivers you know, have a better and a more efficient business and more capacity, et cetera. But those cooperatives, which were grown over 30 or 50 years uh, by the taxi drivers all around the country, um, have really suffered. And, you know, for example, uh, the biggest cab service in San Francisco was Yellow Cab Cooperative, uh, that went bust about three years ago because of the impact of Uber and Lyft, and it is now a privately owned organization. So I'm assuming that a lot of members of that taxicab cooperative lost money because of the bankruptcy, and and so you do you do have that kind of moment that happens. But um, you know I'm I'm really regretful that. Um, Uber has, you know, destroyed one of the largest um, groupings of small business cooperatives. Uh, in this case, in the United States, um, often held by uh, minority groups. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the marketplace changes, and that's a great example of technology coming in place and being used, and we lose these co-ops. What are some other reasons? <laughs> 
Well, some of the other reasons may be that uh, the cooperative uh, leadership doesn't keep up with uh, the changing nature of their neighborhood. Um, it may be also that um, the uh, the invasion of uh, the neighborhood by uh, big box stores and other major national retailers makes it impossible for a small cooperative to uh, have the resources to uh, compete against that kind of goings on. Um, and because the cooperative is uh, small and hasn't grown, it just is no longer capable of withstanding that kind of competition. So you, you have those uh, types of cooperatives who eventually you know, have to close down. Sometimes, you know, they're not well run. Management is uh, not doing its job and the board isn't actively watching the management and the cooperative goes out of business through the deficiency of its um, of its board and management. And th that's always a tragedy because that particular failure didn't have to happen, but it, it but it does. It's not often, but it does happen. Well, I found in housing co-ops that one of the other side of it is whenever greed gets in there, um, mm -hmm. either by the board or management or developers or whatever greed gets in the way, particularly the gentrification, like happens in D.C. and San Francisco, New York, L.A., that when greed gets in, then the co-op can go under and people do crazy yeah. things. Yeah, well, if, if people... Uh you know, are uh, by by transforming their co-op from a, a limited equity type of format to a condo market rate format, people can make you know two three hundred thousand dollars in California in particular. Mm -hmm. It's very very hard for uh, somebody to uh, turn down that kind of offer, and so. We, you know, we have in California now limited equity cooperatives, so that we have a legal format that people can't do that, and therefore uh, we we put a stop to cooperatives being dissolved for personal gain. But many of the cooperatives in the country uh, don't have that legal restriction, and therefore every year we see you know a few co-ops here and there who uh, who go private as you might say i want to change it a little right. bit to the upbeat is that in jessica gordon Nimhard's book collective carriage she talks about that in the capitalistic model that uh, like 90 percent of the business that start are are no longer in existence after five years but we're in a cooperative model you have 10% are out of business in five years. So you have a much greater success rate in co-ops than you do for a whole lot of great reasons, people working together, particularly in pooling their resources and talents and learning how to work democratically, which you've already talked about. So it's, it doesn't happen that often, but I just really wanted to talk a little bit about when it does happen. I also heard, and I don't know where I heard this or read it, that sometimes, uh, for particular for black co-ops, um, that the people in the power, white folks, didn't want them to survive because that gave them power and they wanted to keep control over folks. So maybe that happened. But David, before we leave, we only have a couple more minutes. What about this re resilience of co-ops? I know in the, in the Great Depression and the Great Recession, 07, 08, that they, they performed well. They outperformed. They didn't have few failing compared to a capitalistic model. What, why do you think that's so? Well, I, I think um, under, in particular, under times of pressure, when uh, people in the neighborhood come together and form a food cooperative, and it's really the key to saving a few dollars, getting better quality food, having a few jobs in the neighborhood, and that uh, responsibility is shared by a few thousand other people. Uh, that um, those people will put their money up, they will buy uh, the shares in the co-op, they will put equity into the cooperative, they will be loyal to the co-op, they'll shop at the co-op, they'll uh, speak about it wherever it is that they go. And the determination by, shared collectively by those thousands of members is what allows the co-op to succeed when a local corner store 
uh, isn't going to have that same type of community uh, support. support. We uh, got we got to leave it at that, Dave. Thank you so very okay. much. Always, it's a great, great pleasure. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you, everybody Goodbye, out there. Everybody, live a cooperative week. Thanks. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WOL, and 95.9 FM.